encourage you all to do so, because I'm going to refer to the Bible all the way through, and it's good for you to check what I'm saying. Um, the reading's taken from John 12, verses 20 to 36, on page 1080. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to turn, tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said that it had thundered and an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment up on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We've heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus said to them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk in the light, walk while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you. Whoever, doesn't, whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your word which to us is so precious, because in it we find you, in it we meet with Jesus, and Father, we ask that by your spirit you would bring these words to us afresh today. Please fill me with your spirit that I might speak your word in truth. And all our hearts, Father, we ask that you would fill, that you would speak into our lives, that nothing would get in the way, that we might respond to your great love. And we ask this through Jesus. Amen. Well, we're looking at what Jesus has to say about himself as John records for us. And today, we come to chapter 12. Jesus has come in triumph into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Only a few weeks before, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. So everyone was talking about him. 
Now the festival that's mentioned in, the, in this passage is the Passover. This is the last week of Jesus' life on earth. And here we see how some Greeks ap approach Jesus' disciples with a request. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And this provoked Jesus to respond. So we're going to take a look at what he has to say. Well, the inference from the Greek, from the original, the original for this passage, is that the Greeks who approached Philip were not Jewish people. They were Gentiles, not Jews, but they were likely God-fearers. Greeks who liked the Jewish belief in one God <coughs> and the moral law that he'd given us. These God-fearers didn't generally become full Jews, but they would come to Jerusalem for the festivals. And here, they were there at the Passover. They were welcomed, but they couldn't go into the temple beyond the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. They were allowed so far and no further. If they tried to go any further, they would, they would go on pain of death. Well, these Greeks had heard about Jesus, about this amazing new prophet, and they wanted to see him. So they sought out Philip. Now you might wonder why they sought out Philip. Well, Philip is a Greek name. Remember Prince Philip? He, he was Prince Philip of Greece. So they likely saw in him someone similar to themselves. And so Philip went to tell Andrew. Now, Andrew, similarly, is also a Greek name. So these two disciples went to Jesus to tell him the request of these Greek God-fearers. Well, we don't actually know if they ever got to meet him. I would like to think that they did. But Jesus' reaction is interesting. Because Jesus answered Andrew and Philip, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The coming of these Gentile God-fearers signaled something. With their coming, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Verse 23. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The Son of Man, Jesus, is about to go to the cross. In a matter of days, he'll be betrayed by Judas, one of his own disciples. He'll be betrayed, he'll be put on trial by the Jewish authorities. These are the same people that he's been debating with over the last few weeks. He'd be falsely accused, falsely tried, and then executed. Like a grain of wheat, he too would die. But his death would bring about an unimaginable harvest. We get a clue as to what he meant in verses 31 through to 33. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And we'll come back to that in a moment. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. Jesus was going to die. He would be lifted up from the earth on the cross. He knew exactly what was coming. But the significant thing here is what comes next. He would die. He'd be lifted up from the earth on the cross. And through his death, he would draw all people to himself. And this is a change. In, in Matthew 15, he said that he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Here, he says that when he was lifted up from the earth, he would draw all people to himself. His death 
would bring life to countless people. Not just the Jews who were waiting for the Messiah, but the offer was coming to all. Through the cross, Jesus would truly be glorified. His death would achieve more than any could have imagined. The hour had now come, and God was opening his arms to all humanity. No matter what background, what race or nationality, the offer was coming to all. This is what he meant in chapter 10, when he called himself the Good Shepherd, for he said, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The hour had come for the Son of Man, for Jesus to be glorified. And that was a glory purchased in the agony of the cross. And in verse 27, as he contemplated what is coming, he said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Now it was for this very reason I came to this hour. As he contemplated the cross, so he realised the magnitude of what he was facing. He was and is the Son of Man, <coughs> wholly human, but he was and is the Son of God, God himself made flesh, made human in Mary's womb, fully God and fully man. He was facing the physical agony of the nails and hanging on the cross, dying slowly and horrifically. But as God, he was facing something far worse because he was facing the abominable prospect of bearing the sin of humanity in his perfect soul. As God, he is holy. A consuming fire of perfection. He'd never known sin. As God, he'd never known anything less than perfection. But, and all human wrongdoing was absolutely alien to him. Humanity had been cut off from God because of our sin, because we're not perfect. As Paul writes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, rather than be separate from sin, he was about to embrace it, to bear it, to die for it out of love for us. And this was a horrific prospect. But this was the reason that he came. This was the reason that he came to this hour to die for our sin. And just as a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, and in doing so, produces a harvest of many seeds, so Jesus would die for our sin, to bring a harvest of forgiveness and life to all who will believe. In verse 31 he said, Now is the time for judgment on this world. As God, as he went to the cross, so he judged all human sin, paying the penalty for it. So he condemned sin and paid the price with his own death. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be, will be driven out. Well, the prince of this world is the devil, the enemy. The only power that he has is through sin. Through our sin, he has access to our lives and persons. He was a great angel, and he is in rebellion against God since before creation. He is the enemy of God and of all that God loves. He would keep human beings away from God and ruin us because God loves us. In the garden in Genesis 3, he tempted our ancestors to sin and he broke us. 
we sinned. And from then on, humanity has been cut off from God. When we sin, we put ourselves into his dominion. We give the enemy a foothold in our lives. But where sin is forgiven, where the penalty is paid, the devil has no rights over us. His power is broken, and through the cross, he's driven out. Yes, he has the power to tempt us, but the power of death is, is no longer there. This is the reason that Jesus came, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty, to wash our sin away with his own blood, to reconcile us to God. He came to save us from sin, from death, from being cut off from God, and that's hell. His great, how great is his love for all humanity. He said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. This is the promise from Isaiah, from our first reading. A shoot would come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch would bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord would rest upon him. Well, Jesus is the descendant of Jesse, of David, through Joseph and Mary. He was of David's line. Isaiah got a glimpse of Jesus some seven to eight hundred years before his birth. And at the cross, the root of Jesse, Jesus, would stand as a banner for the peoples, for all peoples. The nations would rally to him. When he was lifted up from the earth, he would draw all people to himself. Jesus knew exactly who he was. He knew he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He knew why he'd come, and he willingly offered himself for us. In verse 24, he said, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. He said that of himself, of his life-giving death for you and for me. He would die, he would be buried, but on the third day he would rise, proving that all he promised is true. But then in verse 25, he applies that same verse to his followers. To all who would have eternal life. To all who would be reconciled to God. So verse 25, if anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Anyone who loves their life, their soul, will lose it. And the word translated as life is the same word that's translated as soul in verse 27, where Jesus says, and now my soul is troubled. Here, Jesus is saying that whoever loves their life as it is, their soul stained by sin, they will lose it. Ezekiel writes, the soul that sins will die. We all sin. We all fall short. We're all imperfect. Sin estranges us from God. It cuts us off from the source of life. If we love our souls, our lives as they are, stained by sin, we'll lose them. If we do nothing about our sin, if we don't face up to it, when our earthly life comes to an end, we will be cut off from God. Whatever life we have, we will lose. But then, Jesus continues, anyone who hates their life, their soul, in this world, will keep it for eternal life. If we'll recognize our weakness, our frailty, <coughs> and our sin, if we'll hate the status quo, the fact that we've sinned, if we hate our sin and turn to Jesus, 
then not only will we keep our lives, but we'll keep them for eternal life. Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He invites us all to come. He raises a banner for all to come. And if we will acknowledge our sin and turn from it, if we'll turn to him and believe, if we'll commit ourselves to him, then we're forgiven and accepted by God. We're born of his spirit and given life eternal. Or as Jesus says at the end of the passage in verse 36, believe it. Trust in the light in Jesus while you have the light so that you may become children of light, children of God. The call is to believe, to commit, to follow Jesus. And then in verse 26, he gives us a wonderful promise. First he says, whoever serves me must follow me. To be a Christian is to commit ourselves entirely to Jesus. To trust in him and to entrust ourselves to him. To serve him and to follow him. And the promise is, that whoever serves me must follow me, even to the cross. When we believe, when we commit, we cease to live for ourselves. We follow Jesus. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. As the old hymn says, O oh Jesus, thou hast promised to all who follow thee that where thou art in glory, there shall thy servant be. If we commit, if we live to serve him, then the promise is that we will be with Jesus. Not that we earn it through service, but we receive it as a gift by faith. In committing ourselves to him, we receive all that he has done. Jesus died on the cross. He died for us. He identified himself with us. And when we believe, when we commit, we identify ourselves with him. He rose from the dead. He's enthroned in heaven. And because we're identified with him, connected to him, will be with him in glory. And that's heaven. And that's something that we can, if you've trusted in Jesus, you can, you can hold on to. Because no one can take that from you. Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He draws. He invites all humanity to come. All are invited. Jesus was lifted up for all humanity. So he invites us and he draws us. But we have to actively accept. We have to believe. We have to commit. We have to follow him. We have to lift him up in our lives. He won't force us, but he loves us. How foolish we would be to feel the draw of Christ and not to accept. For great is his love for you. Let's pray. Merciful God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. Jesus, who was lifted up from the earth on the cross for us. Jesus, who offered himself in our place. Father, we thank you. We thank you and we praise you. We praise you for his death and for his resurrection. That he lives forevermore and draws people to him even now. Father, we ask for that grace to come. 
And we ask for the courage to tell others, to lift Jesus high that they too might come. Great is your love for us. Through Jesus. Amen.